Pauline Kael reviews Star Trek movies from 5001 Nights at the Movies. Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan, 1982. Wonderful dumb fun. The director, Nicholas Meyer, hits just the right amused, slightly self mocking note in the opening scenes, and the same actors who looked flabby and embarrassed in the 1979 Star Trek The Motion Picture turn into a troop of confident, witty professionals. The theme of this endlessly inventive movie is death and rebirth, with the prim, smug Admiral Kirk, played by William Shatner, who has become stiff from sitting at his administrative post, taking a three-week cruise on his old starship, the Enterprise, encountering his old enemy, the maniacal Khan, played by Ricardo Montalban, and waking up. Montalban plays his fiery villainy to the hilt, smiling grimly as he does the dirty. His bravado is grandly comic. The regulars are all present. Mr. Spock, Bones McCoy, Sulu, Uhura, Scotty, and the fuddled Chekhov. And the crew has acquired a voluptuous half-Vulcan, Salvik, played by Kirstie Alley. Such guest performers as Paul Winfield, B.B. Besh, and Judson Scott shine in their roles, and DeForest Kelly makes the prickly bones more crisply funny than he used to be. His performance helps to compensate for the disappointment of Leonard Nimoy's ashen, dried-out Spock. The pieces of the story fit together so beautifully that, eventually, the director has you wrapped up in the foolishness. By the end, all the large, sappy, satisfying emotions get to you. The story is credited to Jack B. Sowards and Harv Bennett, and the script to Sowards. Yet it isn't hard to detect Meyer's hand, especially when he leaves his signature. At a crucial point, he has the hero echo the words of the hero in time after time. Paramount Color Star Trek III The Search for Spock, 1984 with Leonard Nimoy at the helm, this is the first movie directed by a Vulcan. Maybe we shouldn't be surprised that it's achingly prosaic. This one is really only for Trekkies. Others are likely to find it tolerable but yawny. Its predecessor, Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan, ended with Spock's caskets being sent to a newly created planet, the paradisical Genesis where the audience could assume Spock would be reborn. But this new film seems to take a churlish attitude toward its light-hearted, delicately self-mocking predecessor. Almost vindictively, the new film requires that Genesis disintegrate. Admiral Kirk, played by William Shatner, and his venerable crew must steal the now mothballed Enterprise to rescue Spock, whatever form he's in, and take him home to Vulcan. The principal diversion comes from the Klingons, a bunch of ogres whose brains appear to be on the outside of their foreheads, and their lord, played by Christopher Lloyd, who manages to be droll despite the absolute non-existence of comedy scenes. There's also a ceremony conducted by a Vulcan priestess, played by Judith Anderson in her 87th year. Her voice is so commandingly intense it's scary, and she brings a spot of high style to this movie. Her huge, pointy ears only add to her grandeur. The rest of the time there's not much to look at, besides the collection of hair pieces on the crew of the Enterprise, from a script by the producer Harve Bennett, Paramount Color. Star Trek IV, The Voyage Home, 1986 Things are fairly comatose in space, and you may start feeling passive and depressed. But then the seven crewmates travel from the 23rd century back to the 20th century San Francisco to save a pair of humpback whales, and the encounters there between the seven and the more primitive San Franciscans allow for a few modest jokes. Here's a typical scene. Chekhov, played by Walter Koenig, has been badly injured and is unconscious in a hospital, when he is about to undergo an emergency operation. In order to save him from the barbarities of twentieth-century surgery, Bones, played by DeForest Kelly, 
hurriedly and furtively cures him by placing a small disc on his forehead. The scene is meant to be comic, but with Leonard Nimoy directing, Chekhov doesn't wake immediately. He wakes gradually, and when he's asked his name and rank, he takes so long answering that any possible humor leaks out of the scene which has no other reason for existence. Some of the kidding around is fairly genial, and William Shatner's Kirk is less stoic here than in three. He's pleasantly daffy. The others in the crew also have an easy, parodistic tone. But the picture doesn't have much beyond the interplay among them and the jokey scenes in San Francisco. The crewmates are supposed to be technical wizards of the 23rd century, but they deliver their lines as if they were ancient tortoises who had to get their heads out and up before they could say anything. It's a relief to hear two San Francisco garbage men talk, because there's some energy in their voices. And when Madge Sinclair turns up for a minute, as the captain of the SS Saratoga, her crisp, urgent tone is like a hand clap. Screenplay by Steve Mearson, Peter Crikes, Harve Bennett, and Nicholas Meyer. Story by Nimoy and Bennett. Catherine Hicks is the teary-eyed marine biologist. Jane Wyatt and John Shuck also turn up paramount color. And a bonus, Star Wars 1977. One of the biggest box office successes in movie history. Probably because, for young audiences, it's like getting a box of Cracker Jack. That is all prizes. Written and directed by George Lucas, the film is enjoyable on its own terms, but it's exhausting, too, like taking a pack of kids to the circus. There's no breather in the picture, no lyricism. The only attempt at beauty is in the image of a double sunset. The loudness, the smash-and-grab editing and the relentless pacing drive every idea from your head, and even if you've been entertained, you may feel cheated of some dimension, a sense of wonder, perhaps. It's an epic without a dream. Maybe the only real inspiration involved was to set its sci-fi galaxy in the pop culture past, and to turn an old movie ineptness into conscious pop art. And maybe there's a touch of genius in keeping the film so consistently what it is, even if this is the genius of the plotting. Lucas has got the tone of bad movies down pat. You never catch the actors deliberately acting badly. They just seem to be bad actors, on contract to Monogram or Republic, their clunky enthusiasm polished at the Ricky Nelson School of Acting. In a gesture toward equality of the sexes. The high school cheerleader, Princess in Distress, played by Carrie Fisher, talks tomboy tough, Terry Moore with spunk. Is it because the picture is synthesized from the mythology of serials and old comic books that it didn't occur to anybody that she could get the force? With Mark Hamill as Luke Skywalker, Harrison Ford as Han Solo, Peter Mayhew as Chewbacca, Anthony Daniels as C-3PO, Kenny Baker as R2-D2, and Alec Guinness as Ben Obi-Wan Kenobi, a Lucasfilm released by 20th Century Fox. The Empire Strikes Back, 1980 By far the most imaginative part of the Star Wars trilogy. This middle, bridging film is chained to an unresolved plot that doesn't have the leaping comic book hedonism, of the 1977 Star Wars, but you can feel the love of movie magic that went into its cascading imagery. George Lucas kept the first movie hopping by cutting it into short, choppy scenes. Irvin Kirshner, who directed this one, is a master of visual flow, and joining his own kinks and obsessions to Lucas's, he gave Empire a splendiferousness that may even have transcended what Lucas had in mind. When Han Solo, played by Harrison Ford, is frozen into sculpture, his face protruding from a bass relief, the mouth open as if calling out in pain, the scene has terrifying grandeur. The characters in this fairy tale cliffhanger show more depth of feeling than they had in the first film, 
and the music, John Williams' variations on the Star Wars theme, seems to saturate and enrich the intensely clear images. Scenes linger in the mind, the light playing on Darth Vader's gleaming surfaces as this metal man, who's like a giant armored insect, fills the screen. Han Solo saving Luke's life on the ice planet Hoth by slashing open a snow camel and warming him inside. Luke's hand being lopped off, and his seemingly endless fall through space. Chewbacca the Wookiee, yowling in grief or in comic fear, his sounds so hyperhuman you couldn't help laughing at them. The big-eared, green elf Yoda, with shining ancient eyes, who pontifically instructs Luke in how to grow up wise. Yoda looks like a wonton and talks like a fortune cookie. With Mark Hamill, Carrie Fisher, Billy D. Williams, and Alec Guinness, the story is by Lucas, the script is by Leigh Brackett and Lawrence Kasdan. The cinematography is by Peter Sochinsky. The editing is by Paul Hirsch. Lucasfilm released by 20th Century Fox Color. Return of the Jedi, 1983 Some of the trick effects in this concluding film of the Star Wars trilogy might seem miraculous if the imagery had any luster. But this is an impersonal and rather junky piece of movie-making. It's packed with torture scenes, and it bangs away at you. And every time there is a possibility of a dramatic climax, a chance to engage the audience emotionally with something awesome, the director, Richard Marquand, trashes it. In The Empire Strikes Back, the three central figures seemed capable of real exhilaration and real suffering. Here they're back to doing what they were in the first film, comic strip characters wandering through a jokey pastiche of the Arthurian legends. But children who have lived their imaginative lives with the Star Wars characters may be so eager to get the payoffs to the story that they'll hardly notice. And they'll probably be charmed by some of the new characters, especially the tribe of pot-bellied woodland creatures, the furry, cuddly Ewoks, who suggest a cross between koala bears and puli dogs. They're like living teddy bears, with Mark Hamill, Carrie Fisher, Harrison Ford, Billy D. Williams, Anthony Daniels as C-3PO, and Peter Mayhew as Chewbacca. A Lucasfilm from a screenplay by Lawrence Kasdan and Lucas, based on Lucas's story, music by John Williams, released by 20th Century Fox. Thank you for listening.